Hello. Hello, Dr. Nyer, how are you? Good, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. No worries, I'm just thrilled that you're you're willing to talk to me today. Oh, of course, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I um I don't know if you know anything about me, but um I'm Jake and I am nice uh, to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. I'm I'm a health journalist for US News and World Report and I also host a health-based uh podcast. It's kind of just interweaves with one another nicely. Um so yeah, and a longtime yoga student and a yoga teacher of over 16 years and so wow. Yeah, I was really excited to see your study, and I I was happy to see it be passed around the yoga world, <laughs> the yoga community quite uh, quite nicely. Yeah, thanks so uh, much. That's very cool. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about yourself um, before we get rolling. Your background and uh, your position. Sure, I am a clinical psychologist and. I work at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. I have been there since my internship year. So 2009, I've been there. Um, My, um, let me see, I started doing uh, heated yoga. It was, you know, heated yoga um, Hmm. back in Charlottesville, Virginia, when I was getting my PhD in clinical psychology. I was learning how to be a therapist. I was learning how to do therapy. And I was then started going to heated yoga and realized that all of a sudden, a lot of things were getting better in a very experiential physical way that was not getting better with talk therapy. And I love talk therapy, big proponent of talk therapy. And Mm -hmm. there's just an experiential aspect. I mean, I'm talking to um, you, I'm sure have experienced this in your own life and through teaching. But there's an experiential aspect, I think, to the yoga that's within one's own body that does some sort of healing and shifting and physiological work and movement of energy and all sorts of different things that are, you know, that are benefiting mental health in ways that was not captured back when at, you know, so I I was experiencing all this myself, like all of a sudden I wasn't anxious and I'm sleeping better and I can focus better and nothing seems like quite as big of a deal that, you know, used to stress me out. Like the talk I had to give in class to my six people and the, the, you know, instructor was like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. Like when is before I'd be, you know, oh God, I have to give this talk. And it really shifted things. And I started looking literature because I thought like, oh, I want to tell my patients about this because I'm learning how to do therapy. Um, And there was nothing in the literature back then. That was back in like, that was probably 15 years ago. There was two case reports on heated yoga Mm -hmm. and it was like um, a psychotic induced episode. And then that had been triggered by heated yoga. And there was another one, like a hyponatremia, like an over hydration and a seizure that resulted in somebody in the emergency room. Uh, from heated yoga. So that was it, which seemed sort of like scary. Like you look at that and you're like, oh God, you know? (laughs) So I wanted to do my dissertation in it. That was not, that was kind of, I remember getting like a chuckle and a like, oh, wouldn't that be like, it was just too early and it wasn't the right place. And um, ended up coming to do my internship at Mass General. I came as a clinical person, like not as a researcher, ended up sort of serendipitously getting connected to these two men who have mentored me and studied alternative and complementary practices for depression. Hmm. So um, brought up that I wanted to study this. They supported it. The owner of the local heated yoga studio had become a friend. So they let us do the yoga for free. And the place I worked, let us do the assessments for free. And that was our first open label study. And it worked. And then we used that, we parlayed that into some NIH funding for like a million, like a almost a million dollar funding from NCCIH, which is the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, the arm of NIH. Um, And we finished that study, which was the 80 person study that just got published. Um, And that was randomized, but we're using community studios. So anyway, I'm just kind of rambling on, but that's how I got started and uh, where it came from. No, I love it. I, I it's the best when folks are passionate about what they do and are willing to talk. It's a lot harder for me <laughs> when when I have to be doing the heavy lifting. So I appreciate okay. you. Yeah, I appreciate Rambling. hearing that. Yeah, and yeah. so so the study was published only last week, right? A week from today is what I saw. I believe, right? The study was published on the 23rd is the day that it came out. 
and they asked mass general the the journal asked for our press people and we did a press release and i've done like tons of these things where you know our small and nobody pays attention so the fact that anybody paid attention because it is a weightless controlled relatively small study i think there is one other study in the literature now that did beat us to it on women with depression doing heated mm-hmm. yoga and they actually had three cells. So it was three groups. It was like aerobic exercise, heated yoga. I believe in the community, like we did it, same kind of yoga, Bikram yoga. I feel like people aren't using that word anymore, but you know, formerly known as Bikram yoga, whatever you want to say. Um, uh, the hot 26, uh, original hot 26. Um, yeah, to clarify, I don't want to interrupt you, but for folks who don't know, I just like to put it out there, you know, Bikram yoga. I'm sure a lot of people have seen the documentaries, but, <laughs> but you know, one of the most commonly taught hot yoga that is the hottest yoga that you could practice. It's only 26 postures, correct? So it's always the same 26 postures and it's bookended by two breathing exercises. And it was sort of brought to America from this guy, Bikram Chowdhury, and he brought it to LA. And um, I mean, and I think that started the, I don't know actually what happened with uh, Baptiste, but I think mm-hmm. Bikram was the one who brought hot yoga to, I think, brought it to America. All I know is it's the hottest kind of yoga. It's very structured. Um, so you're always getting the same class. It's always the 90 minutes. There's mirrors. There are all these specifications. It's like carpet, mirrors. Your your eyes are open the whole time. So you never close your eyes during the class. It's mm-hmm. a dialogue with like operational commands and it's the idea I think was to sort of get out of your head and focus on just like your body listens to the instructions and the instructions are supposed to get you safely in and out of the postures. But the cool thing for a clinical trial, not only I think the hot matters and I didn't know this back when I started it, I just got bra- dragged to whatever class I was dragged to. Um, but I think you're right. It is the hottest. It's done in 105 degrees with 40% humidity. Whereas some of these other heated classes I think are more in like the nineties. Like if you go to like a heated yoga flow or a Baptiste or a core, I don't even know what core power is doing, but like my understanding is they're a little, they're like 10 degrees cooler. I think yeah, most I think, of that. I think that's about right. And, and um, yeah, and it is repeatable, like the most repeatable yoga that you could find where as far as, I mean, it's the same, like the cues are meant to be the same. The di- There's the dialogue that they say that is, you know, they literally repeat the dialogue, at least traditionally verbatim, like, yes. and I don't know how they do it. How do you, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I love that style. I do it to this day still. Um, but God, God love those teachers. Cause that is a lot of repetition, but there's something really sweet about that. And for research, I mean, that's got to be nice to have a at least as close as you could a uh, uh, repeatable class with the same, you know, less variation, correct? Yes. So okay. one of the things I'm struggling with right now is we're trying to figure out how to design the study to compare heated to non-heated yoga. And it's like good luck finding a non-heated form of yoga that is the same class every time with the same dialogue. And like, what are yeah. you going to like? And then you're thinking like, oh, wait. Uh, you know, okay, we'll ask the heated yoga studios to do that, not in the heat, but wait a minute, their studio is taken on all the peak times and all their community. Like, are you going to go to a non-heated version of that class? Like I'm not, nobody's going to go. People who love heated yoga love that we're all heat junkies. We're not going to the non-heated class. Right. So then you've got these group effects, right? Because you've got the people for the study. If they show up, there's one or two of them. And then you go to a normal community class. There's like, I mean, how many people are, you know, there's like eight to 30 people in the room Mm -hmm. and it's a very different feeling, right? It's like, um, well, and then you've got a a Bikram teacher who's teaching in a non-heated room. Like, are they going to be as enthusiastic about that? That's not their thing, right? Like, (laughs) right. It's so many variables. Yeah. You know what? I want to get into the weeds about this. I love this, but I was wondering before we got too deep into it, if you could unpack the science behind it before I forget A and then B, sure. <laughs> just to put it up front. And then if we could unpack a little bit more, because I love going into detail about this, but what were your findings? You know, you were looking, this is a, a study, a hot whether hot yoga could help treat depression, correct? Or is it to 
is it treat the right word verbiage? <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. It was to, you know, it was uh treat, I think is fine. It's just, we want, I mean, I guess like if I write it, I'm always saying like, we were trying to see if heated yoga to, could reduce depressive symptoms. Mm -hmm. But it is when you say treat, you can look at the re remission and response numbers. Like, you know, did people get below 50% of their original depression score? And then you'd consider it in rem you consider that a response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kind of like a treatment response. And then you can look at, did they get below a, I think it's a 10. I actually pulled up the article just so I could be a little bit more precise. Um, on the this is published in journal of clinical psych psychiatry right yep okay did they get below a 14 on the is clinical ra uh, clinician rated uh scale and that's a clinician rated instrument where we sit down with the participant and interview them and then score their symptoms in a standardized way and that was our primary outcome um and How so efficacious is that that questionnaire in your it's opinion just, it's regularly used and it's one of the the there's like three instruments that are sort of regularly used in antidepressant trials and they're all very well validated very well liter you know there's tons of literature on all of them and they're the hamilton the madras and the ids are like the three big clinician rated scales mm. um the ids to me captures some of them like the hamilton 17 only asks about not eating and not sleeping hmm. whereas the ids covers it both ways so it'll say are you overeating are you oversleeping and i hate when somebody has depression and they're you know a lot of times they're overeating they're oversleeping and then you miss it on the hamilton 17 there's a longer version of it that goes both ways, but I just, the IDS is very straightforward and it is very well validated and used. So we just mm -hmm. picked it. My mentor was using it on an NIH uh, funded big grant. And I was like, I've given all of them a bunch of times because we give them all, all the time, you know, for work. And that's the one that's like the most, I don't know, precise. That, that was just the one we picked. Cool. And okay. And so how many people participated? What was the duration you know, the frequency, all of that good stuff. Sure. Let me pull up our graph here. So we randomized 80 people and we asked them to do eight weeks. And I think a part of this that's interesting is we asked them to go to normal community yoga studios. I know I already said this, but I do think that's an interesting point because a lot of times we're like creating interventions for people or we're doing them in the lab, right? And we're recreating them. I like that they just went and did this with everybody else. In like real like, world, it's non, it's real world. Anybody can go do it. It's generalizable. It's occurring all over the world. There's studios, and it's also sort of depathologizing. It's like, hey, you can go do this, and you don't need to call it anything. You can just you can go do this. You can take care of it. You can like get some self kind of relief from your symptoms. And there's just such growing numbers of depression, and there's such a need for mental health clinicians and people are on wait lists. Like we had like a, you know, we had like long, long wait lists and people are just like struggling and looking for things. And it's something you can do. The people in the study were on and off of antidepressants, stable antidepressants. Okay. There was a difference in how they reacted, which I can talk more about. There is some literature on heat by itself that says it doesn't work as well in people on antidepressants, but it's very preliminary. Um, happy to talk about that. Um, yeah. But you know, it's, it's basically saying you can do this heated yoga in by itself. Cause we have people that did it just by itself. And then we have people that did it in combination with their already established treatment and they both got better. And I think that's very interesting too. Cause it's like, great. Like you're struggling, see your therapist. Great. Do this. In addition, you might get, you'll get relief over and above what you're getting. Um, you know, and I think I was about to say something and I just forgot. Um, you can go ahead. Oh no! It, uh, if you that train of thought comes back to you, interrupt me. But you know the study found that hot yoga reduced depressive symptoms by at least fifty percent. Correct? Yes, that's what little... I see here on Psychology Today. Yes. Then... So what we did. So if you look at the remission data, which is our response data, so that means they got at least a fifty percent reduction in their the ids which is our primary outcome measure of depressive symptoms that mm -hmm. their symptoms reduced by at least 50 percent. it was let's see remission it was 
oh wait, remission and response. So response was 59.3% of the yoga group had a 50% or more reduction in depressive symptoms compared to a 6.3% in the wait list. The wait list meaning they did not participate in any yoga. They came in for their normal assessment visits and then they held steady on everything else. And that's, that's what happened. Results. Okay. And then, you know, so they did the yoga group, 44% of those doing yoga weekly for eight weeks were considered to be in remission from depression or how would you, was that again, that wordage, is that correct? Yes. So it's, it's, it's almost the, the, I I'm looking at a chart that I wish I could like put on a podcast, but there's a chart that has, you could share it if you want. I don't know. You know, I don't know if you're up for me posting the video, but. Oh yeah. I mean, you can, how cool is that? You can do whatever you want. I was, I was not (laughs) ready for the video. I thought we were doing the, you know, I just, my voice was ready, but not the rest, but you can post whatever you'd like. (laughs) Uh, I'm happy to get it out. Um, Well, I'm always like reluctant to folks like yourself. Sometimes they're like, yeah, let's go and do it all. And then other times like, Hey, you know, maybe (laughs) they're reluctant to go on, you know, sometimes. I'm happy to just get the word out. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Um, Okay. So this is, this is what I'm looking at and why I'm thinking it's very visual. Mm -hmm. The IDS is our primary outcome measure. It's just a clinician rated. That's what I was saying. Clinician rated depressive symptom um, gold standard instrument that we use. So if their scores went down by less, if their score, let's say you come in with a 33, anybody, Mm -hmm. or you come in with a 20, doesn't matter. Everybody needs to get below a 14 if we consider their depression in remission. That's just what the scale says that it has been established. So okay. here's the remission data. Remission is a harder benchmark to clear. Okay. And remission because, meaning like when we talk about cancer remission, essentially cured, quote unquote, but it could there's this premise that it, it could come back or how how would you define remission when it comes to depression? That's a great question. And we, uh, like, I think the problem with remission in this case is they are remitted at this moment in time, mm-hmm. right? But we followed them at a month. I don't actually have the data on that quite yet. Mm-hmm. Were they still, what a, a, a follow-up publication and question will be, did their remission last that entire month? For that month, the thing that's messy about it is I don't think we had as good of a, I think we lost some people. You get some attrition at that last one month. And then the other thing is some people went to yoga because they could keep going on their own. We stopped paying for it. Like they stopped, No, we actually never paid for it. Excuse me. It was all donated by the yoga studios. Oh, that's awesome. Um, It was very cool just to acknowledge them. Yes. Um, So they stopped getting free yoga at that eight weeks. They only got it for eight weeks. So, but they could keep going, right? We weren't going to stop them. And we did ask them about that at the one month follow-up. I don't have that data on me. So a question for the, like a next study, a question that I want to look at our data and find out is, does that remission hold steady for that month period? Especially for folks who stop going, right? Because if you get somebody's depression remission, you're like, how long does that last? And my guess is, I'm going to say something that's a little bit depressing. It's that, you know, somebody starts an antidepressant, they get better. And then they're like, oh, doc, I stopped taking it. I'm feeling better. And then their depression comes back. Like, you right. know, it's not, they're not cure-alls. And like, you know, I don't know the, there is literature on how long you need to stay on an antidepressant. And then when, you know, there is some literature on that, but um, you know, I think like my mentor, uh, Chris Streeter has done a lot of yoga research and she always says she thinks it has like a 48 hour half-life. So okay. she thinks you need to go, she believes you need to go around like two to three times a week. And she did a study on like two, I think she did, was it one versus two or two versus three? Now I need to go back and look at her study. I used to know this. I think it was two versus three. The, her yoga um, study? Yes. She did a study on yoga and major depressive disorder. FMRI um, imaging. And yeah, I, I interviewed her about that study actually. Oh, nice. And the do- she did a dosing study leading up to it. And the dosing study looked at the literature. I'm actually on her paper and now I'm blanking on it because I've edited it. And I think it was two versus three times a week. 
And she was looking at this dosing question. It was non-heated yoga. It was Iyengar yoga. Um, But she always says to me, she's like, there's a half-life on yoga. Like people need to keep going regularly or they're not going to sort of sustain the benefit. Yeah. Does that, yeah. You know, it's not like you just, you don't just blast them with something and then they're better, you right. know? And right. I think that's the wish, right? Is like, something's going to just get me better and then I'm better. And I think you're somebody that does yoga as a practice. Like, I think, you know, there's probably things that linger in your system and your body that are cumulative and stay with you forever. And you do need to, I think, consistently and regularly keep going in some way to keep the sustained benefits. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we need future research to figure out how long does the, you know, how often do you have to go? How long does it last? But I don't, my intuition is we're never going to find a kind of yoga that's going to just cure the depression and you can go for eight weeks and then you're better. It just doesn't intuitively make sense, but maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. To find the silver bullet to help with all mental health would be, you know, they're trying to bottle that and sell it to you, but it's, (laughs) could you explain? um, Well, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought. If you want to continue to unpack the study itself, but I do want to go into, you know, depression as a topic in itself, you know, the efficacy of SSRIs, antidepressant pharmaceuticals, drugs, where we stand on that today. And, you know, obviously this is, was bad when I interviewed Chris Streeter after that study, you know, it seems like our mental health has only plummeted um, based on numbers. And so I just wondering if you could comment on the state of mental health, how important this topic is, and also, yeah, the SSRI question as well. But um, I don't know if you want to do that now, or we could table that to later. Sure. Um, So let me... Let me just say one more thing, which is this part right here is just response. So that's basically a little bit easier. It's basically, you have to get below a 14 instead of the, I mean, I'm sorry, you have to get below a 14, which is the remission. You have to get below a 14 Uh, response is you just have to get a reduction in 50% of your symptoms. And that is an easier bar to clear the way that the math works out. Um, So like, let's say you come in with a, um, you know, 34 on the ids, you just need to go down to a, you know, or like a 30, you go down to a 15, or if you come in with a 40 on the ids, you go down to a 20. So you don't always need to get so low. So this is a remission is harder in antidepressant trials than response, but that's a little bit technical. It's like, basically you can see if you do the yoga, you have a much greater chance of remitting or responding in terms of depression and response. So like almost 60% of people in the yoga group responded, meaning 60% of the people who went in and did the yoga, their symptoms reduced by at least 50% by the time they came out at eight weeks. That's all that means. This basically means in terms of remission, which is the higher bar, which you had to get under a 14, 44% of the people that did the yoga, those people after eight weeks of yoga, 44% of them were remitted in their symptoms of depression as compared to, and then you see the other bar is just in both cases, it's 6.3% of the waitlist group. So it just helps visually to be like, okay, you've got much greater odds if you go into the yoga group, the heated yoga group to get better. Hmm. Well, how do you measure their symptoms? Is it a questionnaire that it's, or how do you measure the response and what is, you know, how do you... when you talk about the, symptoms, yeah. <laughs> sure. So the kids, I probably know it by memory now, but it's a 30 item questionnaire. And it's like, um, you know, it asks about how often does it take you a long time to fall asleep, stay asleep? Uh, how often do you get up early? So there's three of those sleep qu- questions. There's a question. Um, I'm just going to give you some examples. Like how often do you get more than seven to eight hours of sleep, including naps in a 24 hour period? And we're always measuring on the ids the past week. Um, except for two questions asked about the past two weeks. I think the weight loss or weight gain asks about a two-week period. Um, We ask about appetite up or down. We ask about, uh, do you get any brightening, like interest, motivation? Is your mood responsive? Um, Libido. We ask about physical sort of feelings of depression. We ask about guilt. We ask about in self-criticism. 
Um, we ask about suicidality. It asks about, um, what else? I'm trying to think, interpersonal sensitivity. So being like easily rejected uh, sensitive, criticized. Like sometimes when people get depressed, they uh, will have trouble interpersonally because everything just feels so hypersensitive. Um, yeah, we ask if it be if it's better or worse at any time of the day because sometimes people will feel worse like at morning or night. Uh, we ask if it's different from grief because we're trying to make sure it's real depression and not just like a grief reaction. Yeah, symptoms yeah. like that. Okay. Does that give you? Your... Yeah, that's that's. That's great. I was, wasn't sure if, um, yeah, just wanted to get clear on how you measure symptoms. And I know fMRI is one way and then questionnaire. And so, okay, no, that's really helpful. Yeah. And this is clinician administered, which is considered better than self-report because self-report, it's like just the person and the piece of paper, the clinician administered, we can be like, um, you know, we ask about psychomotor retardation and agitation. Those are two, which is like uh, psychomotor retardation is like, do you feel slowed down and speaking, talking, moving, thinking? And someone will be like, no, I'm fine. But they're like, no, I'm fine. And you're like, okay, do you, you know, and you can just tell that they're, they're flattened. They're taking a while to respond. And mm -hmm. you're going to give, a, you're going to score on that. Even if they're telling you like, no, I'm fine. So there's more of a clinician judgment. So there's a little bit more objectivity and the clinician that does it is blinded. So they don't know which group the participants in. Cause if I'm doing them all, I'm of course going to be like, Oh, you're doing great. You're in the yoga. You must be doing wonderfully. You know? So, um, uh, it's clinician administered. And I think like even more objective, like self-report, right. You've got that here. You've got mm -hmm. clinician administered being better than that. And then you've got like, even more objective is like a brain scan or a, <laughs> physiological test right because there's no objectivity it's just this is the hard scale science fact your blood sugar is that right or your number is that um inflammation or whatever you're looking at so uh you know chris Druder's brain scans are more objective than the clinician instrument and, but how okay. do you depression unfortunately we don't have a biomarker or a brain marker of like that is depression Right. These instruments are the best that we have in terms of depression. And how do you measure it? It's like Chris is taking her brain scans and trying to see how they line up with depressive symptoms, but she's using, she actually used the Beck depression inventory, which is like the gold standard self-rated. Okay. And she's using that and then trying to figure out like how do bio, you know, how does the brain in these brain, I think it was like thalamic GABA levels. How do we see that and how does that correlate with depression and depression getting better and people who are doing the yoga? Okay. I've heard folks pick apart fMRI results, but I haven't really listened in depth to their critiques. Is there, that is an accurate measurement or tool to use to measure depression fMRI imaging or... So I think like, you know, I know there's people, there's a guy, Diego Pizzagalli, who's interesting at McLean, who does like reward sensitivity with depression. And he's got a whole paradigm he's come up with where you can see how sensitive to reward people are. Um, and there's different sorts of ways that people have looked at brain brains with for people with depression. I am not a neuroimager. And my understanding of this stuff is like, we tried to write a grant on his paradigm for reward learning. So I know like a teeny bit about that, but when you work with people, like if I'm going to do a grant on brain imaging, I go and ask the brain imaging expert and they come in and they do that part and we try to work together. So you don't want me unpacking the field of brain imaging for depression. But what I will say is I don't think there's like a brain scan if there was, I don't know of it. And I'd be really missing some major thing, but there's no like brain scan you can do to say like, this surpasses in doing this instrument, you and me and trying to figure out if you're depressed. I don't know of any brain marker or biological marker that can just do it quickly. And you've got your answer. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have those biomarkers and okay. the brain is yeah, like there's parts of the brain that have been encouraging and people have done like really interesting things. It's just, I do know it has been criticized too, but it's like, because also it's like, what then? Like, 
mm-hmm. you know, I also like, for me, I'm like a pragmatist. I'm like, sort of like, I want to see things that work and I want to see them getting out to the people. And I want, you know, cause a lot of times we do these studies and there's no clinical impact or it's like, I think it's like 17 years used to be the average number that like a study went from being done to like it being implemented in like the clinical world. So for me, it's just like, I'm like, there's a lot of people suffering. We have like a mental health crisis. COVID made it worse. And I'm sort of like, how do you get things that work out to people quickly? You know? Right, right. Whatever that may be. So this this is really promising. This These numbers are impressive. And after eight weeks of them, of participants practicing yoga, how what's the frequency? Once or twice a week, was it, right? So we asked them, this is sort of interesting. We asked them to go to at least two classes per week, which would be 16 classes at the minimum because they could have gone to as many as we want. And we were like, oh, we're being, we're being, we're, we're making it more appealing because people can go as much as they want. And they're going to want to do this. And people went on average 10 point, I think it was like 10.1 or 10.3, meaning that's closer to one class per week. Yeah. Yeah. And to be fair- <laughs> If you've done Bikram yoga, hot yoga, it's 90 minutes. You got to prepare. You got to also shower after for sure. <laughs> you've got to, well, there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot of legwork that goes into, I feel that class there's, it's hard to find a 90 minute yoga class these days anymore, which is interesting, but, um, they did, they did the regular 90 minute class, right? So they did the 90 minute class. And I will tell you, as the study was being done, studios were starting to shift a little bit to the 75 and 60 minute classes. And so on the schedules, it's this interesting thing that's happening. I think it's getting like decentralized a little bit because it used to be, it was just like, you do this 90 minutes and it's always that 90 minutes. And I think the training has become decentralized a little bit. Like there's different trainings popping up and it's not just that original training that's happening, even though that one still runs. And I think studios are now having a little bit more, like they're taking a little bit more of their own agency. agency. It's not just sort of as, yeah, it's not as centralized. So I think they're trying to figure out, hey, is this more feasible for people to do 75 instead of 90 or 60 instead of 90? And do they, I think like literature, first of all, we need to do a study to figure out if 60 is the same as 90, because I don't think it is. I've done those 60 minute classes and I don't feel the same. Mm. 75 minutes, I can like get there, but it's there, you know, but you're always measuring, you're always trying to figure out feasibility versus efficacy, right? Like what's the minimum dose or like that somebody needs to do to do it and then get a fact, but it's still feasible in their lives. And I think with heated, with this kind of yoga, you're bringing up the exact issue. It's like, I need to be, to get to a class, you need to find the class, which they're not always that many. You've got to plan that 90 minutes. You have to get there. You have to be hydrated, but you can't just hydrate right before because then the water is just sitting in your stomach and it's not circulating in your body. And you've done this. It's like a very hard class if you're not hydrated. So you've got to be hydrated. You can't have had a big meal within three hours or you're going to feel that because you're heating your body up into fever range temperature. And that's very uncomfortable. You have to have time to shower afterwards, right? Like you're not walking right out of there. So it's just it's a very intense thing. It's more like a medical procedure than it is like, you know, you're signing up for like a two and a half hour chunk with preparatory work and planning your meals and hydration. And, you know, so I think it's really hard to get to two classes a week. You're asking for these studies, we're asking people with moderate to severe depression, a lot of whom have never gone before to start a yoga practice that takes like, what would you, I mean, it's like two to five classes to acclimate to the heat. You've got to figure out a new studio. You're already contending with like issues in energy levels, motivation. You're feeling down and hopeless and lethargic. And then we're asking you to go do this like impossible thing. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. As someone who does yoga a lot, I'll say it's hard. Like, and I know yoga, again, if it's not this style, the umbrella is casted where it's just like, it could be anything. You say yoga, but you know, relatively- Vigorous yoga, I don't even think holds a flame to this style. I mean, it's, is your sense that's probably part of the reason why, so mechanism and what is causing this profound benefit 
to help with depression? Is it the exercise aspect, the heat aspect, mind body connection, all of it? Or do we know? <laughs> You're asking an excellent question. And you know what? I, I actually intuitively, I feel like I keep using the word intuitive, but intuitively, remember that story about like, I don't know if it's people that can't see or it's dark and they're all touching an elephant and they all think the elephant's different things. No, no, I never heard of that. Like, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, if you just touch the trunk of an elephant, you're focused on just that trunk. And then, but you can, t I think the physiological system, first of all, you have the physiological system of the human body, which is so complex and dynamic and intertwined. And like, you can look at yoga and there's like benefits on, like, first of all, nobody really knows why he did yoga. I can tell you some of the theory and I can tell you a study that talks about heat. That's very interesting from a, a collaborator and mentor of mine, uh, Charles Raison did a study that was published in JAMA Psychiatry on heat by itself for major depressive disorder. Hmm. And he, I can pull up that study and show you that graph. It, he got findings that are just really astounding. And he got effect sizes between the whole body hyperthermia group. It was one whole body hyperthermia session. And he brings you up to 101.3 in this heating device called the Heckel. It's a German device that brings you up to, to a fever. It can bring, it is used in cancer. It's used in Lyme disease and the European in Europe. Um, they bring you up to much higher temperatures and he put people in with also, they were either randomized to the whole body hyperthermia or the believable sham where they just put the leg heaters on and their temperature rose actually more than he wanted it to. He wanted it to just be a sham. So it felt like a little warm, but they actually got their body temperature actually did increase a little bit, um, not to the range of the, the active condition. And he got effect sizes that were over two and it lasted for six weeks from one session and those effect sizes, so going back to effect sizes of antidepressants, I can circle back to that question. Yeah. We see antidepressants work, uh, the effect sizes are like 0.3 to 0.4. That's sort of the magnitude of the difference between the antidepressant group and the placebo group. The To give you an example, this whole body hyperthermia effect size is like five times that, hmm. that he found for just heat alone. And it was published in this very good journal and... It's a very exciting study. It was, uh, so that shows that maybe heat by itself is very potent antidepressant uh, uh, agent. Mm -hmm. We have a study, what he found is IL-6 shot through the roof after they get out of the whole body hyperthermia device. What's IL-6? IL-6 is thought of as an inflammatory marker. And what inflammatory markers he he expected that all the inflammatory markers would go down with the after whole body hyperthermia and that longitudinally they would go down he just published on this in 2023 he's the last author um and basically there was no change in longitudinal inflammatory markers that we would expect to go down they all and there's some reasons for that it's like kind of there's some messiness in all this but IL-6 shot up and IL-6 is typically like when you say IL-6 and everyone's like oh IL-6 is bad Apparently they call it, and this I'm learning from my colleagues that know more about this. I'm a psychologist. This is all new to me. It's pleiotropic, meaning it can be good and bad. It can be, um, you know, if it's elevated for a long time and it comes from different places and I'm not going to remember exactly what parts of the body it comes from, but when it's elevated long-term, it's bad. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. You know, you don't, you don't want it. When it shoots up after whole body hyperthermia, they actually saw that, that the increase in the degree that it increased was associated with how antidepressant, the antidepressant response of the person. So they found the higher the IL-6 shot up, the greater the antidepressant response. So we actually wrote a follow-up grant on this because it's like so interesting. And I'll tell you, IL-6 shoots up in exercise and there's a study of Bikram yoga where they took Bikram yoga practitioners and they have them go into a hot room and a non-hot room. And they looked at inflammatory markers and IL-6 shot up in the group in the hot room and not the group in the non-hot room. Hmm. And they think that IL-6, what they mean, I think by pleiotropic is that when it goes up like that, I think it's a, a positive signaler. And I think what that mean? It's like, it signals for anti-inflammatory effects to cascade. So there's like anti-inflammatory cytokines that you want to have, and then it suppresses the pro-inflammatory cytokines that you don't want to have. That is my understanding of what this IL-6 is signaling. It's like signaling and it's like signaling that a cascade is going on. And we're doing a study right now to try to capture the cascade to see if that's correct. Cause nobody looked at that. Um, and we're doing that with 
uh, Simi Foster's running that. And we're doing that with this Chuck, Charles, he goes by Chuck, but his name's Charles Raison is mm. guiding us because he did that. He's sort of the the father of this in uh, psychiatry. Interesting. So that's, where is he based out of? So Chuck was at Emory and then he was, wait, it's Arizona. He moved from, I don't remember if he was at Emory, then Arizona and then Wisconsin, or if it was Arizona, then Emory, then Wisconsin, but he's now at Wisconsin. He's also um, in leadership at this place called USONA that's bringing psilocybin to market. So his two things, I think, uh, of pillars of research right now are psilocybin and whole body hyperthermia. When you say whole body hypothermia, most folks hear hypothermia and they think cold. How is now, how are you inducing hypothermia through heat? Is it, or is that what's happening even? So I think like uh, hypothermia is cold. Hyperthermia is cold, uh, it's hot, sorry. It's like, you know, in diabetes, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. It's just Mm -hmm. going low, one's going high. So it's hyper. uh, Okay. Yeah. Um, whole body hyperthermia, hyperthermia. Yeah. So we're going up and we're using, I'm going to show you actually, because we're in, I'm going to show you the heckle, um, heckle. And hyper, hyperthermia is what, is that feverish? He said like, uh, heated enough to be a, considered, uh, a fever or what's the marker there for hyper? Thermia. Hyperthermia. I'm going to show you what this looks like uh, cool. right here. This is great. Hyper- with the <laughs> hyper- you, I mean Chuck. Uh, yeah, and we have a colleague. Um, hold on, let me see if I can find you. I got the picture right here. So this is a device. You can see it right here. The <laughs> heat. The lamps are on. That's it. And you lay in the device, and it brings you up to a fever range, and you can. There's a rectal thermometer in your body and it's connected to a computer. So you control it pretty tightly. We are looking for ways to not have to use a rectal thermometer, but that's like the gold standard for how you get core body temperature. So there's like, we've spent like countless hours dealing with like how to, you you know, there's like temperature pills and some of our colleagues played with them and they're like, that's not safe enough. You know, they're not, cause you really need to be careful. Otherwise somebody's gonna get heated too high. Mm. Right. So so you have a rectal thermometer in and you're connected to a computer and it's monitoring your temperature and you start this device and people just start climbing. You know, it takes about 42 to 45 minutes for the body to actually start the increase in temperature to start going up. And then it takes about like 90 minutes to get there. um, And it just starts heating your body. You're getting these four things above your chest. They're all on and it's like going right into your body Whoa. and the temperature is heating up. The tent's very hot. There's like leg heaters. So the tent's hot and you're getting blasted from these four heaters and your body is just increasing. And we go to 38.5 Celsius, which is 101.3 Fahrenheit. And they turn off, they kill all the heaters. And then you do a cool down phase where you're in there for 60 minutes, just laying there in the tent. And you cover yourself with a towel and actually your temperature goes up for a little while. So people go up a little higher than 101.3. Um, and then you'll start declining. And then I think we take everything off for 15 minutes and you sit there. And that is the procedure. Huh. And this is found to be effective for a, the same depressive um, symptoms then. Heat, heat alone in itself. So he had a pretty similar population. He required major depressive disorder. I did not, but I think the populations were very similar. Um, And yeah, he found basically, I'm trying to uh, pull up his graph quickly for you. It's It's a really beautiful article. And it basically just shows that that one treatment of whole body hyperthermia, you know, for that, it takes like two and a half hours total reduces mm-hmm. depressive symptoms for up to six. He followed them for six weeks and that's like all he can kind of comment on, but um, wow. six weeks. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's impressive. I might have to hunt this person down and talk to them too. <laughs> he's incredibly interesting. And I'm, I have his article and he's a nice guy. There's, I can also, there's a woman at UCSF who's doing research with, um, She's using sauna instead of whole body hyperthermia. Like she's getting whole body hyperthermia through a device that's commercially available. 
So you don't have to deal with the FDA. If you deal, this device is a medical grade device and it's a significant risk device because they use it in cancer studies up to like 104. They use it in Lyme disease up to like 106 or something and they put you under anesthesia. Oh. And there's like some interesting theory about why that works, but I want to show you Chuck. This is Chuck's the last author of this article. This is a whole body hyperthermia article. This is his graph. So this is week zero. This is where you're getting the whole body hyperthermia versus the, the believable sham. And just that line goes right down and you can see it hold steady for six weeks. Wow. And the effect sizes, it's really cool work. And the effect sizes, I love this study. Here's the effect sizes. So week one, that's the effect size, 2.23. And antidepressant trials run from about 0.3 to 0.4 on average, the effect size. So way more effective, huh? And I mean, if you divide 0.3 or 0.4 into that, it's probably like five times would it go into there? Five times more effective? It's just the signal. It's the degree of the antidepressant response. So it's just a very, something very powerful is happening. And he was telling me that he thinks the reason he got it into this journal, it's a very good journal, was because- jump. JAMA psychiatry. Yeah, but that's it. JAMA psychiatry okay. um, is partially. He thinks they they liked it because the sham was so believable. So what sham exactly? Sorry, sham is like you're trying to trick somebody to think they're getting the active treatment because there's placebo effects, right? So if I mm -hmm. tell you that you're getting an antidepressant and you don't know which one you're getting, the placebo effect is pretty strong because you're like, oh, I could be getting that. I can't tell the difference. If you're doing a psilocybin study you pretty much know which, which, which drug you're getting, right? Like even if they give you niacin and your face flushes, like uh -huh. you probably know you're not getting psilocybin, you know, it's like, it, like mm. it's a, so it's hard to kind of placebo control some studies. It's tried, it's hard to create a, a really, a believable sham or a believable condition where you're totally convincing somebody to get the treatment because you want them to believe mm -hmm. you want both thinking this is why heated yoga comparison is so hard because it's like you can't convince somebody they're doing heated yoga when they're not so our control condition discussions it's like that's like the bane of my existence for any future study is like what do you control this to and i you know i'm happy to talk about that but so in chuck's study with whole body hyperthermia 71.4 percent of the people in the sham condition thought they got the active condition how did he do that because he turned on the leg heaters and what he under accounted for is his whole theory is that people with depression have thermal regulatory dysfunction. What that means. And when I say this in a room of psychiatrists, they look at me like I have five heads. They run a little bit of a temperature. They're a little higher than baseline that they should be and that they don't sweat very easily. Hmm. They're not good at regulating their temperature. I lost so, your video. Sorry. I don't know. Do you see me? Oh, wait, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Got, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. So he's basically saying that these people have thermoregulatory dysfunction and you put them in a whole body hyperthermia device and you're resetting the thermoregulatory system, hmm. which is sort of this interesting theory. And if you read his stuff, they have, he works with a uh, um, researcher at Boulder, Chris Lowry, who does really interesting um things on um <clears throat> he can explain he's done this in like um rodent models and like they can show that the it's like the serotonergic uh there's something related to the heat and the serotonin it's in my it's in the article we just published and it's essentially they think that heat is activating the serotonergic neurons in the certain part of the brain and they have a whole fancy theory that i'm not gonna embarrass myself and try to explain but the two of them are very interesting. Both of them are really nice uh, and very smart. And this is their area of research. Um, mm. So yeah, I probably got us a little off topic, but no, that, that I, it's related. Right. That heat aspect is a big component yeah. of this potential, yeah. this, uh, the results you think the outcome. I do think so. And we don't know to answer your question. Like we did some inflammatory biomarkers and found nothing but we did them longitudinally. We didn't ask people to do it right before and right after. And I, my suspicion is if we did it right after, we would get that IL-6 bump, that mm -hmm. huge increase in IL-6, and that that probably is doing some sort of an anti-inflammatory cascade that's really helping people on a physiological level. And then you're sort of like, what's it doing to the, their, we took, we don't have our cortisol data analyzed. We did do cortisol, but you know, there's this idea that, um, 
these inflammatory markers and the cortisol, for example, it's like longitudinally, if you just get them, if you like get them pre post eight weeks, it's harder to see results than it is like give somebody a stress test, like a, ask them to give a speech in front of people with like a neutral face and then look at their cortisol reactivity. It's easier to see a change in that than it is to just measure somebody's cortisol, just come into the lab when we're going to take your cortisol before and after eight weeks. So the inflammatory markers are kind of looking like that, but I think we're just like the human body is so complicated. So it's like, is like heart rate variability and sort of nervous system tone and parasympathetic, you know, you want your parasympathetic nervous system to be in good, um, to be able to be more, you don't want your sympathetic nervous system on all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, like, you know, heart rate variability can kind of measure that, like how strong are you able to sort of like shut down that sympathetic nervous system? I think maybe would be a good way to explain it. And like, we didn't measure that and you can measure that, um, inflammatory markers. You can look at brain parts of the brain. You can look at cortisol. So I think there's all these different, uh, biological markers that could be explored with heated yoga and our study found nothing. And I think it's, again, I think there were a couple, I think it's a small sample. And I think we missed, we didn't uh, recruit people that were inflamed. Like we, it's sort of like measuring depression in a sample of people that aren't depressed. Mm -hmm. There's only a subset of people I think with depression that have inflammation that you can measure. And we didn't, we didn't select for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future follow-up studies. Okay. And so now you went into depth about the heat aspect, which is very important and fascinating because obviously, you know, that's what makes this style of yoga, particularly unique, challenging. Um, And the exercise component, is there an exercise component to this? Like, could you see, do we find the same sort of benefit if someone were to go for a light jog rather than go into a hot room and be tortured with (laughs) with yoga poses? I love doing that, but the heat aspect, obviously you might not get that outside running or at a gym on a treadmill, but, um, you know, the exercise component of the yoga class, I think this style is by far and away, a, like I said, a very difficult cardiovascular component to this, right? Yeah. So you're asking an excellent question. This group beat us to it. LaRoque and colleagues out of Canada. They, what year did they publish? 2021. They did a randomized control trial and it was exercise, aerobic exercise, heated yoga, weightless control for depression, women with depression. And they used a state-of-the-art Hamilton's like a great rating scale for depression. So they did clinician, uh, clinicians interviewed them. Um, what they found is that the aerobic exercise did not, the Bikram yoga and aerobic exercise, they were equivalent in their ability to reduce depressive symptoms and both beat the weightless control you will see that their samples are small. So I think, let me find, where's their groups? Hold on. I think it was like, here's their, it's small groups. It's like uh, 15, 15, and 12. Hmm. So was their sample big enough to see it? So the here's the, the issue with this study. I love this study. I love that they were able to put the aerobic exercise in it. They weren't in the heat, right? The hmm. problem is, is that when you have such small numbers, aerobic exercise works for, like, will help depression. Heat will help depression. Yoga helps depression. If you want to compare heated yoga to the exercise component, which is part of why it works, you're going to get a response. So let's say like my hypothesis would be the heated yoga would beat the aerobic exercise. Eventually, if you had a bigger sample, I'm, you should, these folks would be great for you to talk to too. Um, I don't know if they agree with me, but it's mm-hmm. just because I love heated yoga and that's what I want to believe. But because active exercise has an effect size, if you think of those effect sizes, right? Like let's say exercise has an effect size of 0.6. Let's say heat Bikram yoga has an effect size of 1.3. You've got to power it such that you can see the difference in those sample, in the, the signal between the two. It makes it so you need much larger groups of people because you've already got, you know, you've got a pretty robust effect size just from depression alone. So you've got to beat that with the heated yoga. And that's very hard to do with small samples. It's like, because there's such a small difference between them. What's the goal standard for sample size? Like what's considered good or like, um, um, 
you've got to power it. So I always talk to our statistician and you've got to figure out there's like uh, sample size calculators online and you figure out like exactly what number of people you need to prove. You got to figure out like what your estimated sample size or uh, effect size is going to be. Like you'd, you'd look at the literature and say, how robust is exercise for those with depression? Okay. On average, you see about a 0.5. Let's look at all the Bikram yoga studios uh, studies and see, okay, there's two of them. Let's see what the two effect sizes were for people with depression. Okay. There's like a 0.3 difference between the two. We have to power this to figure out how to get a 0.3 difference between these two samples. And let's say you need 160 to do it, 80 per group. It would probably be something along those lines is my hmm. guess, but I am totally just making up numbers. That's not. Oh, it's helpful. It's helpful just to know. I uh, minored in stats, but that was so long ago. <laughs> Yes, you probably so know more about this than I do. I just go to the statisticians <laughs> and ask like, hey, I want to do this. And they say, can you give me some effects? That, like, can, mm -hmm. what's the literature say about the size of these, the power? And then we tell them and they shoot us the numbers back. And when you give them, when you give them non-heated versus heated yoga, I've sam it's like, you need a lot of people in each group. Yeah, and you had 80, right? I had 80 total, but then I think there were like 60, I have it right here. It was 65 that we analyzed. And so you've got like 30, let's see, I've got it right back up here. 30, um, I think it was 32 and uh, I wish I, I should know this. That's 30, two, complete it. So 22 and 36, wait, 26 and, oh, no, here it is, 33 and 32. Okay. That we analyze per group. That that seems those numbers obviously double that previous study. So, but you know, every study is different. Were you happy with that participation, that level of sample size? So we did a modified intent to treat. And what that means is as long as somebody did a baseline and then went to at least one class for the yoga group and did an assessment after it. Or for the wait list, they had to just do like one assessment visit. They were included in the analysis. So this doesn't mean that everybody made it through the study. I would have liked to see better numbers for, um, like you can see here, 22 out of the 40 completed an endpoint. So that means 18 people dropped out mm -hmm. out of 40. That is not what I would love to see. It, it is a hard kind of yoga and we are asking people with depression to do it. And right. I met with everybody for 45 minutes to prep them for the class, telling them all the things, hydration, what to wear, what to expect about the breathing, about listen to the dialogue. Don't go as far as you don't go, you know, only go as far as your body allows. Like we did, we tried to kind of prep them to have a better experience, mm -hmm. but even in so doing that, <laughs> 18 of them did not make it to the end point. Yeah, it's hard. It is very hard, even if you're motivated. Um, very hard. It's a very hard thing to do. You walk out sometimes feeling like elated, as you can attest to. If mm -hmm. you know, if your system doesn't crash and you're not dehydrated and you don't have a bad reaction, if right. you, you know, yeah. So, but, and yeah. But yeah, and then it's so worth it. Obviously, um, usually you get through that, like you said, an acclimation period, and then it's game on benefit. <laughs> um, yes, mostly. Yeah. And sometimes you'll have a bad class here and there where you're kind of a little, like I, I used to, I haven't been practicing regularly lately, but when I practice regularly, like most of the time I was pretty delighted when I left. Sometimes you're like a little dehydrated, dizzy or whatever, you know, you ate too much, but for the most part, like you walk, I would walk out of those classes and like everything looked brighter and I was calmer and mm -hmm. everything felt a little bit more manageable and things I was stressed about. I could tell what was real and what wasn't. It's just, it really is a, I think it's, it's part of what's so potent about it is it's a major, it's a major, um, you're getting such a intensive shift. You know, it's, it's, it's when mm -hmm. you go in, you leave your Chuck calls it an adaptive stressor. He calls exercise heat and whole body yeah, Bikram yoga. He calls them lifting weights. It's like, you're putting your body through this stressful thing. Yeah. Like hormesis I've heard, right. Yeah. Something similar to that or 
Okay. It's like good stress, like good stress. Yes. So you're strengthening your system because you're putting it through these stressors. So it's very hard, but then you, you know, when you come out of the gym, you have sore muscles. When you come out of Bikram yoga, you're dehydrated and need hydration. But what you're doing is you're stressing your system. So that's building up this strength. Mm. Yeah. You definitely get that. If you stick with it, even just a couple of weeks, I feel and um, wonderful. So why this is so important also is, could you talk a little bit about SSRIs, the state of antidepressants, um, their efficacy? Um, I talked to Chris Streeter about this, but this, that was, you know, when that study was published, I think it was like seven years ago or something, six years ago at this point, but yeah, the um, I'm trying to see if I can get like the number for you because it's like not antidepressants like work. I don't know what is it like a third of the time or uh, I I want to be able to like give you a number, but it's basically like antidepressants. You know when they work for people they work and I I see patients clinically and I have patients on antidepressants and you know some people I think it saved their lives like mm-hmm. which you know so not to not to talk down about an antidepressant, but there's a, I want to say it's like 40% respond to antidepressants, but you, you can look at it different ways. Like you can cut the data different ways, but there's like a large population of people that don't respond and you can keep trying. And then star D there was this major antidepressant trial that uh, one of my mentors was involved in and they would like step up the care. So it's like you do one and then they randomize you or you like go to a different level and you kept getting like, and then you get an augmentation and then you get this. And, um, and it's, you know, you can keep, you know, you can do like a SSRI plus Wellbutrin and then you'll get more efficacy for some people. And, you know, so there's, there's a large percentage of people that it doesn't work for one. And then two, they come with side effects and, you know, whether it's weight gain or fatigue or sexual side effects. And I think sexual side effects are a big um, one. It's like, you're kind of having to, you're weighing these pros and cons, right? It's like, if you're really depressed and you can't function and you're overwhelmed, it's like, yeah, you may, and it works. Maybe it's worth like a little bit of sexual dysfunction to just be able to do your job and function and take care of your kids and be in your relationship without feeling like totally overwhelmed all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. Um but I think that that antidepressants, it's like whenever we write a grant, we find all the literature and we say they work. I could open up any of my grants and probably give you some numbers, but like, right. right, they're not working for a large percentage of people. And then if they do work, you've got side effects. And then you've got people, a lot of people, it's like they're on it and it helps a little bit, but they're not fully in getting or in remission. Okay. And I'll tell you two of the uh, women in our study one of them was getting ECT, so electroconvulsive therapy, um, which you only do when depression is very treatment resistant. And she was in maintenance, so getting it like every six weeks or something like that. She entered the trial. Or the ECT had helped her kind of get to, you know, she was working, but you could. she was functionally impaired. And she started the heated yoga. She was an athlete to begin with. So mm-hmm. I think that actually helps. <laughs> if you're going to send somebody to bed from yoga, it's like, if they're an athlete or they understand discipline with the physical body, I think that does help people. The other one was like a, some sort of a dance, some other kind of athlete. We did two case reports on women with severe treatment resistant depression. And both of them, these are published in the literature, left the study with like almost no depression. Hmm. And they just added it to their treatment regimen. So everything else study. And it was like those two, the reason we wrote them up is it was like, wait a minute, like people with pretty intensive treatment resistant depression that are getting like the most advanced treatments and it's not working. Maybe there's hope you could add heated yoga to these people's regimen and they're going to get better. Like, that's pretty cool. We were not expecting that. And that was just two people we wrote those up on, but that again, I think just, it's like antidepressants can sometimes like uh, Lisa Ubelacher at Brown did a study on I think she calls it persistent depression or sometimes they'll call it resistant depression. And it's like people who are on SSRIs, but still meet criteria for depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, they may be doing a little better, but they're not doing great. Yeah. I've had so many friends, not so many, but those willing to talk about it, just say that 
almost like they lost a couple of years of their life on them. Like they felt like elevator music, like they didn't feel yeah. pain or discomfort or depression. However, they did not feel anything. They didn't feel happy or any range of emotion. And that's just anecdotal from friends talking about it and why they wanted to get off of it. But yeah, it's just, it's like, it works differently for different people. And then like, I mean, I've seen people in therapy where you're like so happy that they're on one because their life just gets so much, they, you just can see them start to become themselves and like flourish. Right. And then there's other people where it just doesn't do much. And I, you know, I'm looking right. at the numbers. I just Googled antidepressant efficacy. NIH says 40 to 60 out of a hundred who take an antidepressant notice an improvement within six to eight weeks. And yeah. that's like a better end of what I usually cite in grants, but yeah, it's just, and then the people that are on them, like you're saying, it's like, they'll feel blunted or they'll feel like, well, you know, it's sort of, yeah. Yeah. Not. It's like 50% of the population that it's not effective. And then of that yes. 50% around, then there's these other side effects that aren't great, <laughs> but. Yeah. So it's just not a, it's not like, I think everybody was hoping that they would like, I think there is some, you know, they're disappointing in some ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not that they don't work. And when they work, it's great. It's just like, you, you know, that's not a great number when you're trying to help. And especially with like, it's like what, there's like a 25% increase in depression with COVID. And it's just like, people are suffering and like the world has been pretty brutal lately. So I think like, you know, there's just depression. I don't, you know, I don't know exactly what's causing this uptick in depression, but yeah, it's, well, I also, it's a, it's gotten to be such a topic, which it, obviously for good reason, and you got to be careful how you phrase things. But I do think oftentimes like people who maybe have a bad day often get grouped in with someone with schizophrenia too. And like, I feel like sometimes we talk about mental health, just general public wise. And uh, some articles I've seen in the general public that uh, kind of group mental health as like, one big thing, you know, like depression and, you know, I had a, a bad day sometimes I feel, but, nice. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. Um, I feel like, yeah, it's definitely, if SSRIs were the answer, I feel those numbers would be better <laughs> as opposed yeah. to getting worse and a lot worse. It seems since I last reported on it with Dr. Streeter, um, so yeah, if there's something like a yoga and a hot yoga that's affordable and not a pharma a, a drug, to at least like try it, it's worth it. And right, yeah. And I think like we wouldn't be having a mental health crisis. Like I, I remember Tom Insel, who used to run the NIH. He has some article about depression and sort of the crisis of depression and how like numbers and suicide numbers wouldn't be getting worse if our antidepressants were just like working great. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that doesn't, I don't say that to like discourage, like if somebody's listening and they're depressed, like go talk to your doctor, try it. It might right. help for you because there are like 40% of the people or 50, whatever it is, it really does help. And like, especially if you're like suicidal or you can't function or you're like about to quit your job, like, you mm -hmm. know, when you're dealing with like a severe level of stuff, it's like, please try like, cause they can really help a lot of people. But on the other hand, you're kind of like, we would not be facing this major mental health crisis, if you just gave someone an SSRI, it worked for everybody and their depression went away. Right. That's not how it's going. Yeah. And um, what other, is there any other component that you looked at that was, or a mechanism, like the mind body aspect, the meditative aspect, or yeah, is there anything else that was, that stood out to you or that you looked at in the study? So we're actually doing an article right now and I haven't seen the article, but um, two of the people are using this data to do it. And I, it'll come to me when it's like more almost done, uh, but they're looking at, I think it's uh, mindfulness and rumination as mediators of the treatment response. And I think that both were implicated in some way. And I've used that data uh, to support a grant and it's either, but I think there's some indication that both 
let me look at our data actually, but I, you know, I think we have mindfulness data in there. We have, um, what is mindfulness? And mindfulness is like, we use this five, uh, let me see if it's, we didn't actually report on it in this article. So I have some data that we didn't include in this publication that we will include in a secondary one. So we have uh, rumination and mindfulness, which we did not publish in here. Mindfulness is like, there's five factors in it. We use the FFMQ, which is like the five facets mindfulness questionnaire. And it's five different way, you know, um, scales. And it's looking at mindfulness components. And it'll be like, you know, I'd have to look it up to tell you the exact scales. But we wanted to see if mindful, you know, is mindfulness increasing with heated yoga? And is that a... Um, is it a mediator? So is that a pathway through which people are getting better was one of our questions. And then we looked at, you know, so rumination here, we're looking at anxiety. Um, rumination I mean, being like a, a sign of depression, right? Or yes. So it's frequently a, a symptom of depression. And it's very hard to treat. It's very hard to interrupt. And I do think as somebody who does heated yoga, you can attest to the fact that if you're ruminating about something, when you go in, you've got the dialogue and the heat and you're looking at your body and you've got to focus and you're like kind of trying not to tip over. It kind of makes you focus and ground into the present moment. And mm -hmm. it sort of makes you interrupt whatever thought process is going on because you're having to listen and you know there's a lot going on that you need to do. So my hope would be, and then it's sort of strengthening your focus and your ability to then return your attention to the present moment. Mm -hmm. It's sort of my, my hope in what's going on. Okay. Um, Anyway, uh, what we saw in this study, we also measured quality of life, perceived stress. We looked at, um, this is exercise induced feeling inventory. So this is like states of positivity associated with exercise. Uh, these three positive engagement revitalization, and then physical exhaustion is not positive, but, and I guess physical exhaustion, did we see that that wasn't significant? No, wait, where's my significance here? It was significant. So all this stuff was like during uh, or imagine after the after yes after. okay so this is not that interesting it's like yeah so people feel physical exhaustion with heated yoga people felt more tranquility they felt more revitalization and they felt more positive engagement i guess in their life is my my suspicion with that and that's like a trend that's not actually meeting significance but you have um, anxiety, I think was significant trait and state in normal. You don't see people don't believe that they think state changes, but not trait, but we actually saw a change in both, which was not expected. Do you, uh, what does that mean? Trait versus state. So state would be like, I don't know why that just did that. Uh, state is like, um, I'm anxious about this interview. So I feel anxious right now. Mm -hmm. Trait is I'm kind of neurotic at baseline and I get really anxious about a lot of things. And that's like my trait. I was like born with that. Okay. Interesting. Or I'm very anxious because, you know, I, um, I don't know, some traumatic thing happened to me and it's, you know, it's, 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 but I'm kind of, it's like a state dependent. And once I kind of recover from that, I'm going to, my anxiety is going to go back down to my trait level. So we weren't expecting to see they, the trait level shouldn't have changed, but it did. So that's kind of interesting. Um, this is uh, physical, this is like um, quality of life, sort of physical functioning, just functioning, that's 36. And, you know, on here we saw, where's my p-values? What was significant? Role limitations due to emotional problems got better. Energy and fatigue got better, which is a frequent problem with depression. Emotional well-being got better. Social functioning got better. Pain did not, mm. uh, wait. What's the general health? Yeah. Oh, wait, social functioning did not get better. Sorry, pain, emotional well-being got better. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, these are just, we we measured other things while we, you know, secondary outcomes. Um, these are all based on questionnaires or are you doing a clinical assessment? Or all is... of these are baseline self-report questionnaires that we took, you know, pre and post. And actually, as they went through it, they took them like, I think a lot of these they would take during their like most, uh, we assess them like every two weeks. Um, this, the HDRS is the Hamilton. So we gave two clinician rated scales at certain points. Um, so this was clinician rated and that also went down. And that's nice to see that that went down too, in addition what, to the IDS. What is that 
Exactly. The Hamilton is the scale that I was talking about. It's a clinician administered gold standard rating scale for depression, but it's the one where they only measure under sleeping, under eating. They don't measure overeating, oversleeping. So. Okay. um, Yeah. The the literature and psychology is really fascinating to me. It's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I, um, now, were folks who participated, had they had practiced yoga before? Did you ask them uh, their history with yoga? Because I feel like those who had some experience, right, might be more um, willing to, the feasibility might go up. They might participate more. Or- yeah, so our inclusion, exclusion criteria is right here. And in terms of exclusion, we basically said you cannot have a regular yoga practice for the last six months. We basically took Chris Streeter. We looked, Chris Streeter was a mentor on this and she, um, and Lisa Ubelacher also uh, d- has done a lot of liter- research in this. So we looked at like how they were doing it. And basically we said this, we like just, a, we, you know, you just sort of look in the literature and try to figure out the best way to do it. So we said, mm-hmm no more than six hours of yoga or other mind body practices within six months prior to screening. Hmm. I do feel like there is, at least in my experience, when someone's brand new to yoga, that benefit is like, that's like a benefit goes up very quickly or they see a benefit, a a greater benefit. And then, you know, maybe it plateaus and then it, there's obviously continuous ebb and flow and mostly benefit, but that, that initial introduction to yoga is like, wow, what's happening here? <laughs> there's a lot of benefit, I feel. Yes. Yeah. And I think you miss that. Um, that's why we did it because it's like, you're already getting a great bump of the benefit, like right when you start, like you're saying like in two weeks, like if you look at our data, you see the benefits start to happen. Here's what our, this is the data. So this is your, um, you know, your yoga group is right there. And you start to see when does the yoga group start to get better by week three, they're almost totally separated there. So the benefits happening pretty fast. You know what I mean? Like you're, they're separating more and more over time. Like we're getting assessments at week one, three, five, and eight. By week eight, you see the two lines are much farther away, but you're starting to see those benefits at week three. So if, you know, somebody entered the study and they were already doing better, you're just going to capture less of that benefit because you're not getting the dramatic reduction Mm -hmm. in symptoms that you see, right? You know, right when somebody starts to practice. Right. Huh. It's interesting. I love that it aligns basically with the real world experience, at least uh, with my my real world experience. And I think most, but it's cool that it's, you're bringing it forward in, in research. Yeah, I think it does align with real world experience. And like, that's how you figure this stuff out is like, you're trying to study this, but you want it to be applicable to the real world and you want it to represent the real world. And if you bring it too far away from that, it's not that useful. Like, right. Because you need it. Yeah. So, and I think with this, it's like, you know, I've heard the Bikram yoga teacher say like, do 30 days. Have you heard this where they say like, do a 30 day challenge and then back off, then you can do three times a week or whatever, four times a week. And that kind of argues for like doing this strong bolus, like the strong, like injection of like, here's your intervention. Let's like reset your system. You're going to feel so much better. And then you can back off once you've gotten the benefits, like, here you go. We're taking you through this process. You know, you're getting better, better, better here. You get your benefits and then you've got to like sustain them, but you do like a really strong, like 30 day practice, feel really better and then back off of it. I don't know. Like that's an interesting study. And then I think like there's other work to be done to figure out, are there gentler ways? Like, let's say we figure out heated yoga is much better than non-heated yoga for depression, which I don't know that everybody needs the heat. And I don't know that it's good for everybody. I don't, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's say we figured that out, which I don't know that ever we'll find out, or we find out it's good for a subpopulation, like those with anxiety or something. And then we figure out like, it's really helpful to, 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 to help people get into heated yoga to maybe do offer warm classes where people can do Bikram yoga at 95 degrees for a few times 
And then they jump into the practice and we find that that eases people into it, especially with depression or I don't know, like, you know, there's just so many applications where it's like, we could study 75 versus 90 minutes, try to figure out if they're equivalent. And then it's like, wait, you know what? People can go to 75 minutes. Like that's enough. You know, Mm -hmm. there's just like things that research can answer that could be applicable, I think, to the real world that we haven't even begun to explore, unpack. Like there's still such low hanging fruit with heated yoga and mental health that, and yoga, you know, there's a bigger literature for yoga, but um, with yoga, it's harder to, to even research in some ways, because you've got to create the intervention because the intervention isn't already self-created for you. Hmm. Like Chris Streeter spent years developing that Iyengar protocol. Really? And she had to like get fidelity and she had to work with the instructors and she had to make a manual and she had to, you know, and she was like always tweaking it. And, oh yeah, it's like, she published on that manual in her first uh not her first it's in the um, it was like in 2000 I want to say 17 it was her study of yoga versus walking and she published the manual the yoga manual in there but she spent years developing and tweaking that manual because she had to create it there was nothing to just step into and it is I mean yeah it is a world of Gosh, you talk about Bikram versus Iyengar talk versus Vinyasa versus Yin versus whatever the hell everybody wants to teach because it's a freaking <laughs> free for all sometimes. I mean, what's nice about yeah. studying this is at least you could get close to replication, I guess, with the same postures, the same duration, the dialogue. My opinion, even in Bikram yoga, the teacher does matter. Uh, but at least, you know, you go into a Bikram class, you're going to get what you're going to (laughs) get, you know, what you're up, up for, which is pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. And I do agree with you. The teacher totally matters. And like, you can feel their energy and you can feel their attitude. And I've taken classes. I think like some of them back in the day used to be very militant and sort of like, there could be like a harshness to them and I feel like that's kind of gotten weeded out over the years like that's just not that same sort of mentality but when you have like a kind competent really positive skilled teacher the class is so much different yeah the voice inflection too with that I there's a teacher I adore in Philadelphia Chris Flock who uh is also a professional he's an actor but boy his voice I mean in that class especially it's like, if you say, lift your arms up, or if you say, lift your arms up, everybody's like, he's like, watch the poses. They all get better. And especially in that, when you're in that heat, you got that timer going, like even the duration of each single pose ought to be, at least in Bikram, the same, right? Every time that they might be deviating now a little bit, I guess, um, potentially as the, that style evolves, but classically that's what's going on. Right. And that's, that's what you use for this study then. Yes. And Jill Kuntz was the head yoga instructor. She owned with her brother, the two yoga studios when we started the study and they changed ownership. It was like the beginning of COVID. And I feel like a lot of studios changed ownership or, Mm -hmm. you know, went under and stuff like that. But um, she's been the one that's like led up all the instructor stuff. And uh, she is one of those teachers where you go in and she's just very, uh, She's very clear. She's very powerful. She's very positive. And you feel like contained and like you won't, you listen to her. You're like, I'm going to listen to her, you know, uh-huh. like she's a presence. She has a powerful presence and she's like impeccable with her dialogue and yeah. she makes sure you're in the right position and you just feel very held and you like, you just get in line. You like do what she says without yeah, they create a container for that level of growth that the, no matter where you are in your practice, you're getting a benefit and those are gems. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. It's amazing. The good teachers really make a difference, which I don't know what we, you know, so for our study, yeah, for studies, it matters, but it's like, it's hard to control all these different aspects. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next? Where does this take you? What's, you know, what's next in this field? Do you think, I mean, I guess this could go, obviously we talked about many different directions, but what excites you? What What do you think is next? Um, when are we going to start prescribing yoga for depression? Is like when could doctors say just when will the 
you know, yeah. medical doctors, you think be all on board of like, would be great if they could get like a prescription for a Bikram 30 day challenge <laughs> or a hot yoga. I know. So they're doing a very large scale study of non-heated yoga versus behavioral activation through this mechanism called PCORI, which is like patient-centered outcome. I forget the acronym, but it's like a many million dollar grant by uh, Lisa Ubelacher and Louisa Street. Uh, wait, Chris, <laughs> Lisa Ubelacher and Louisa Sylvia. I'm combining Chris Streeter's name in there. Um, <laughs> doing this grant. And that's going to be exciting because it's comparing yoga in a very large scale multi-site study to a proven depression treat behavioral activation works for depression and they're comparing them. So that's exciting. Um, I feel like we need these larger scale, well done multi-site yoga studies. First of all, with non-heated yoga, but then you also need them. Then we've got, you bring the heat element into it and heated yoga for depression. It's like, there have been two studies there have been two randomized controlled trials so far. Hmm. And that's Pretty it. Ours and LaRoque and them from Canada. Wow. That's it. That's... So it's like, it's just what, where do you go from here is like a question where I'm like, well, like it's I want to know. Yeah. yeah. It's like, that's what it's like, oh my God, there's candy everywhere. It's like heated versus non-heated. You could do a two by two where it's like heat no heat, yoga, no yoga, try yeah. to really tease out the components. Louisa, Sylvia, and I are trying to do a study for a foundation called Tiny Blue Dot Foundation. Um, and it's a nonprofit based out of California, um, really cool nonprofit. And they just funded, I think they did, they're doing their third year of funding and they funded 11, $900,000 grants last year. And we got one of them to dismantle heated yoga for rumination. And we were going to use home domes to try to do that four square where it's like heat, no heat, yoga, no yoga. It is proving to be quite challenging. Um, the domes, they, uh, we blew a fuse and they deflated and then the heat, like, I don't know if you've tried these home domes. I've seen them. No, I have not myself, but. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's cool. They're cool. It's just like trying to get, they're like 25, like, I could see wanting to practice in my own house. If you got good at setting it up, it would be like a lifesaver, mm -hmm. especially during like the height of COVID. And yeah. Um, so we're trying, we like blew a fuse, the thing kept deflating. We couldn't get it like, so we're trying to figure out how to execute that study and if we need to pare it down. Um, so that's going on. We're applying to the NIH to study, to get the infrastructure running for a large scale study. But that's like, many years in the making, like there's a first step that's like feasibility of two sites. And then you go to the next step, which is like the large scale efficacy trial. So like, that's my hope is to one day get that going, which it would be a large scale multi-site efficacy trial mm. of heated yoga in the community. And I guess the question is then like, what's your control and, it, you know, non, you know, do you, do you compare it against non-heated yoga? That's a very hard bar to clear. Mm -hmm. Again, the effect size is so, you know, you're looking at these, you're, you're looking at a very small difference between the two groups. Maybe nobody's compared them head to head heated and non-heated yoga. So it's like, oh. for me personally, I know that I need the heat to feel better, but that is not enough. <laughs> right. Right. You know, like that <laughs> is not a study. Right, right. <laughs> like I, you probably have an opinion, but you know, you and me are like probably heat junkies. So like, right. Yeah. Like if you talk to, I remember that I just gave a talk at, um, a, a talk on this data at Kripalu, somebody came up to me and was like, he was clearly a long-term yogi and he had, you know, he was like, my teacher taught me that the heat has to come from inside the body. And that when you bring the heat outside the body, it's cheating. And that's not the way. And then another guy was like, no, like I heard Kundalini rises with the heat. Oh boy. I need the heat. And I'm like, and I'm thinking <laughs> to myself, like, I am no expert. I cannot answer this. Like, I only know this is what I like. So I study it. <laughs> like, you, know, right. I, you got I the know yoga what? and uh, the yoga teachers and the yoga people coming after you. <laughs> yeah oh yeah it would work oh yeah i give talks and people be like why are you using heat and they get like very upset about it and i'm like like to be honest like i did it it works for me i think it should be studied there's evidence heat makes a difference outside of yoga right we need to study it and i clearly can't say with any sort of certainty outside of my own personal preference <laughs> like yeah yeah like, 
You're people here. do get like you know it's like anything unfortunately yeah. they get i'm in my like i don't teach heated yoga i have in the past not bikram but people get in their you know camps it's like anything else they're like heat is good no it's not like it's okay to <laughs> yeah it's like okay to also be like it might work for some people and not others like my yes. mom hates heat hates it if i ever put her anywhere near a heated yoga class she would be miserable. Like she's mm. probably not somebody you're going to ever try to get to do that. And why is that? I don't know. Is there some physiological thing? Are we going to figure it out someday? Probably. And then the doctor can say, Hey, you're somebody that should do non-heated or right. what can somebody who's like, maybe doesn't love exercise. Can you just put them in a whole body hyperthermia device or a sauna mm. and mm -hmm. get enough benefit? Like they don't need to go do the yoga. Like, yeah, I don't know. Interesting. And then it's like, what are you using it for? Like, if you're using it for like flexibility, moving lymph fluid and fascia and muscle tightness and stiffness and getting tension out of your body, I don't know if heat would do that by itself. I would imagine heat plus yoga has a stronger ability to do that stuff. But like, it's also what's your outcome, right? Like, yeah, we know that yoga by itself helps low back pain. So like, what I think is really cool about heated yoga is it's combining a lot of potent things into one. So not only are you helping your depression, but like, you know, Rob Saper has a study on low back pain and compared it to a very specific posture sequence to physical therapy. And he found it was equivalent. That is pretty cool. And That's then you're right. thinking to yourself, okay, we haven't showed that for Bikram yoga, but let's say down the road, you know, heated yoga can help for low back pain. It can help for fibromyalgia. It can help for uh, musculoskeletal pain. It can help for anxiety, it can help for depression. It can help for uh, like Stacey Hunter is somebody you should interview. She's done a lot of work on Bikram yoga and showed it helps with like arterial stiffness and insulin sensitivity and um, other stuff. She's an exercise physiology sort of end of it. Stacey Hunter would be great for you. Um, but she showed all this stuff. So it's like, it's packing a powerful punch. You know what I'm saying? It's like, right. you're getting the benefits of mindfulness. You're getting the benefits of heat. You're getting the benefits of yoga. You're doing all the things that all those things do to your body. In addition, like I'm looking at depression, right? That's like one little piece of the whole body. But again, if like, if it could actually help with like, you know, back pain, especially in like military populations where they're carrying all these heavy packs and they're getting all these back problems and they're because it's so physically intense mm -hmm. i think heated yoga t t you know does something to all your the, 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 you know your skeletal system all that stuff like a lot of people report those benefits it's just it's packing a powerful punch and it can help a lot of different issues at the same time right because of all these different components and it's working on the whole mind body system and i don't think you can like take away the mind and the body and separate it and we try to in research but it's like What's it doing for you on a spiritual level? What's it doing to your energy system? What is it doing emotionally? What is it doing to the emotions that are stored in your body? What is it doing to your physical system? It's like, good luck capturing all that. We yeah. don't, not sophisticated enough. Like maybe the aliens know how to do that with their fancy flying techniques, you know, but like, right. we don't, we just measure a little discrete parts of it. Yeah, it is. It is fascinating. And <clears throat> and it's really pro it's so promising. I think so many people get excited to see your work, something like this. I I just hope more people continue to take uh take that and go ahead and try it and implicate it and move the move the needle a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Like if you get, I don't know, like if somebody lists like sees the study and then they're like, you know what, I'm gonna go try that. Or maybe I'll go try sitting in a sauna, you know, maybe I'll we'll just get them an idea to go do some hot, cold therapy because they think about temperature and it helps them like whatever it does. It's like, I think the, the bottom line is like, if you're depressed and you're sitting at home and you're waiting for a therapist for six months, they have a wait list and you're, you know, you can't use your insurance and you're down. It's like, give it a try. And there's a heated yoga studio. Like, just give it a try, try five classes, try a one week. The one week intros are cheap because the studios try to get you hooked it takes a while to acclimate, make sure you just hydrate and don't eat a big meal, but give it a go, you know, and see if it helps you. And if half the people that try it get hooked and it helps them, like it would be tremendous to just see, you just want to see like global suffering go down. Yes. Right. Right. And it's, 
hard for folks to unfortunately do that mental math sometimes. And I, but to hear you say it, you know, I say it as a yoga teacher, but to hear a scientist, someone who studies it, say it, you know, it, you got to think of it that way. Like it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it's really empowering to know that you could put it, take that into your own hands and have a, a, a real shot at, you know, helping yourself. And it, and it is effective. Yeah. Like you want to see people empowered to help themselves and get out of these states of suffering. And like we did our open label study and we had these graphs we did where it was like, basically the positive states went up, you know, like optimism and um, quality of life and um, energy, you know, we have a chart and then you see the negative states go down with heated yoga, you know, anxiety, depression, um, physical, I guess, cognitive and physical functioning went up in the positive one, but you know, it's just this idea that it's like lessening states of suffering and increasing states of well-being, whether it's vitality, optimism, uh, you know, you know, it's just, mm. you want to see that shift. You want to see the the positive going up and the negative going down. And, you know, depression is sort of, we call it depression, but what is depression? Like, that's a whole other topic. It's like mm-hmm. people are suffering, right? It's suffering. Yes. And it's a medicalized way of saying it, but it's a, it's a form of suffering. So it's like, it's a lot of, uh, yeah. And you want to see people to feel empowered to do something about their own suffering and take agency and, you know, feel physically empowered, emotionally empowered, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. I think just showing up might be the hardest part for someone in a tough spot, you know, and if I think we could get them in the door that's the hardest thing sometimes is to just get folks to try it. Um, even if they do half the class and have to sit through the other, yes. half, you know, it's just get into that hot room and there's benefit just in that, like we talked about and take your time and stick with it. And right. Just, I feel like that barrier to entry, we just need to get more folks yes. interested then- in trying it. It's like the barrier to entry, the the hump of the acclimation period, and then it's like consistency, I think is key. Like mm-hmm. this study actually trended towards significance that dose mattered. Like the more you go, the better you get. Our first study showed the more you go, the better you get. When you collapse the data, I haven't published this yet. It showed like, because the weightless period did the yoga after the active period. So if you combine them together, the more you go, the better you get. So basically to me, that's just like, go regularly, try it out. you got to get over the heat period, the acclimation period. I mean, some people, it may not be for them and they may just know right away. I went to my first class and I was on the ground for 45 minutes and my stomach was pulsing. I was so overwhelmed. I was so mad because I looked around and I'm like, why can everybody else do this? And should be said, it's not uncommon. That's for Bikram. Like that's, I've seen many friends say like, why am I doing this? And sit down because they had to like, but like also, yeah, just so folks know that that is maybe I would say, I don't know, this is me guessing, but folks I know who have tried it, who are brand new to it, at least I would say 40% have that experience. And I'm pretty like physiologically sensitive, like people who are like a scanner of their body and always like are aware of every sensation, like you're going to have a harder, like for me, I'm like, oh my God, my stomach is pulsing. Like I just, yeah. I was having this like, you know, and then I'm like, oh God, it's going to get nauseous. I'm going to sit down. Like, <laughs> and then I'm like pissed off. Cause I'm like, why is everybody else do this? I want to do this. I thought I was in good shape. This doesn't right. make sense. Why the heck can, and you're doing this whole thing. And then I came back the next day cause I bought a week. I'm like, I'm going to try this again because everybody else could do this and I'm mad now. And then the next time I stood up and I started sweating Uh and it was like the most invigorating, like I was like, whoa, Mm. because it's cathartic. There's something about that sweat mixed with the movements. And I was like, oh, this feels amazing. And then I came the next day because I'm like, I'm going to try this again and see if I can do this. Mm -hmm. And I got kind of hooked, but it took a bit and it was like, yeah, it's a, yeah. It is. It's it's an acclimation period, like you mentioned. That that is very much a real thing. And even as someone who does it a long time, like I did a three year stent where I almost went well six days a week, often seven days, and then. But yeah, well, you know, there's some Bikram teachers like ten thousand classes in a row. You know. <laughs> oh my god! And you're just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How? 
there was a woman i forget who has the record but all those teachers know her they're like don't even try for the record she's done it for three decades without missing i'm like what but at any rate i'm not trying to say that i was anywhere close to that but i will tell you even after three years of study there would be classes where i'm like i gotta calm down i gotta sit down like it's, brought to, it, will, it will bring you to your knees sometimes yeah yeah but just like you said find the time that's only like an hour and a half of your your day and even if you like you said have to sit down get through that introductory week and it's totally worth it and I used to like when I now it's hard for me to go in because I don't go as often and I remember some like maybe like a therapist or a healer of some sort said to me like like go into each class and set an intention to letting go of something for each class and you like dedicate that class to that like it's your intention mm-hmm. like I want to let go of my self criticism or I want to let go of my guilt about this or my avoidance about this or I want to let go of me avoiding my my you know, my uncle, like whatever's bothering, like set an intention that like, I'm going to try to like, let this go with today's practice. Cause you're, it's such a, you're like making this almost like sacrifice to go in. You're like going into the inferno yeah, with your oh, body. It's... And here I am. And then I just sort of like that idea of like, I try to go in now and I'm like, what am I, what's my, like, you know, when you write your, um, like you write a book and you put an acknowledgement yeah, yeah. Sort of like, what am I dedicating this class to? Like, I'm going to dedicate this class to feeling better about my body and not letting go of some of the self criticism mm. about not being in good shape for yoga. Or I'm going to let go of some of my criticism about the weight I gained. Or I'm going to let go of, I want to let go of this breakup. Or I want to go let go of this fight I had with somebody. Or I kind of liked that. And I'd never heard that before. And like, yeah, like your intention, your why. And it's so true. And it's, um, I love that. And it does feel literally, mentally, you finish that class, it's as if you shed your old self and you're a yes. new. Yes, that I couldn't have said it better myself. You are a new. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's something about it, like the sweat you see on the, the <laughs> covered on the towel and everything. Oh my gosh. It's it's it, tough, but it's worth it. I feel, you know, and it, it'll make you, make you better. I feel on every level. Yep. It rings you out you and you cleans you off. I like feel back to my pure self. That's the best way. I feel like I get like wrung out like a towel and it's like, it takes off all the gunk off my aura, whatever I've absorbed and taken in and, you know, the traffic and the person yelling at me and the client who doesn't let, you know, and I'm, and it's yeah. like, it, it gets rid of it and sheds it all. And you're like back to your like purest form for mm-hmm. a little bit. It, uh, yeah. I so love it. And, you know, this is really great. I'm so happy. I've reached out. Oftentimes I'm like, man, I'm throwing Hail Marys. I really hope they answer. And so thank you. I know My your time is valuable and like, My this pleasure. is so pleasure. great. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you. You too. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. All right. See ya.